everybody knows Chanukah comes around, and when Chanukah comes around, there's always an association that's made between Chanukah and light. We know we rekindle the candles, we kindle the candles of Hanukkah, representative of the light. Everybody knows that the source of this idea of rekindling the light is because we were in exile, Golos, was called Galut, and this exile was called the Greek exile, which is alluded to already in the Torah, in the very first section of the Torah, when it says, V'choshech al Tahom, there was darkness over the abyss, and the Medrash says that that darkness refers to the exile, the Greek exile. Now, we rekindle the light on Hanukkah, and obviously a light is symbolic not only of the physical light of those candles, but obviously of a light of the Jewish people which has been extinguished, and the commentaries explain the light of enthusiasm, our enthusiasm for Torah and our enthusiasm for mitzvahs, and that's part of the job, that's what we're trying to do, trying to accomplish on Hanukkah. Very interesting, a few years back, maybe more than a few years, about 20 years ago, is an Israeli reporter writing for one of the, the editor of one of the main secular Israeli newspapers, a man named Amnon Denkner. And Amnon Denkner presented a challenge to the secular Israeli public. It was right around Hanukkah time. And Amnon Denkner challenged the secular Israeli public, and he said to them the following. He said, just imagine the battle is taking place today. So we know Hanukkah is, involves battles, it involves sufganiyot, the jelly-filled donuts that everybody enjoys on Hanukkah. Somebody once said that the jelly-filled donut is a perfect miracle food because you eat one and it burns inside for eight days. The perfect miracle <laughs> food. So we all know we all enjoy the jelly-filled donut. There's a certain symbolism there. But other than the jelly-filled donuts and the menorah, there was a battle that took place, the battle against the Greeks, against the Maccabees, and this battle was won, the few against the many. So this Amnon Denkner challenged the secular Israeli public. He said, just imagine that war was taking place today. The Greeks who stood for culture, entertainment, immorality, a life of no restraint, versus the Maccabees, the Chashmonaim, who stood for a life of devotion, Torah study, Tehillim, self-control? Just imagine that battle was taking place today. Whose side would you be on? Would you want the Greeks to win? Or would you want the Maccabees to win? Would you want the side of entertainment and no restraint to emerge victorious? Or would you be for the side that represents Torah study, devotion, self-control, loyalty to God? A very provocative question. I remember when I read this, actually heard about it, my reaction was, boy, I feel bad for any secular Jew who's got to grapple with that issue. How do I, whose side? I'm celebrating Hanukkah. I'm celebrating a victory. But in fact, if I was asked right now, I probably would want those who suffered the defeat that they should emerge victoriously because that's really where I'm living my life. That's the direction I'm going. And then I remember I had a very unpleasant second thought, which was, forget everybody else. Who do I want? Who would I want personally to emerge victorious? How much Greek value do I have in myself? How much of my life, which I hopefully is a life of devotion, but how much of my life could use a little bit of brushing up on my devotion? It was a very provocative question. It was a question that annoyed me. I wouldn't say that it ruined my Hanukkah. Maybe it should have. But at least... It's food for thought that a person understands what are we celebrating here? What is this really all about? So that was the challenge facing, it's a challenge that faces all of us. How much of our life is being lived with that Hashmonoi influence? And how much, what percentage of our life is being lived today with that Greek influence? So we start analyzing the Greeks. The Greeks go and they make decrees against the Jewish people, against Torah, primarily Torah study. But all the other decrees they made, what was really bothering the Greeks? So I'd like to tell you a little story. An incident took place here in Israel. There were two men who were sitting in a hotel lobby here in Israel, somewhere in the north. And they were trying to cut a business deal. And they had a lot of cash on the table, about $10,000 cash. At a certain point, somebody yelled out that there is a suspicious object. What's called in Hebrew, chefetz chashud. Everybody in Israel, living in Israel, knows that word. Chefetz Chashud is a suspicious object. Everybody goes running away till the police sappers come. So he yelled, Chefetz Chashud. They cleared the hotel lobby. 
and the two men ran outside. 20 minutes later, police sappers came. 20 minutes later, they gave the all clear. Everybody went back into the hotel. These two men go back in, and they go over to their table, and sure enough, the $10,000 is missing. Police sappers or no police sappers, $10,000 doesn't last long exposed on a table. So about a week later, as another man is walking through the hotel, and he goes and he sees there's a flower pot in every hotel lobby. He has a big plant in the lobby, and he sees something green picking, peeking out from under the flower pot. So he pushes this vase, he pushes it back, and sure enough, there's $10,000 cash. What had happened was that one of the foreign workers, as soon as they called the alarm, one of the foreign workers took advantage. He took the money and he put it underneath the pot, underneath the flower pot, and he, uh, he expected to come back when the lobby clears to be able to recover his money, but the lobby never cleared in the course of a week. There's the money, $10,000. He could not get it. In comes this Haredi Jew, and he walks in, and he turns back the, this flower pot, pulls out $10,000. What does a Jew do? He finds $10,000. He goes to his local rav, his rabbi, and he asks him, what's the halacha? I just found $10,000 cash. What's the halacha? What's the law? Am I allowed to keep it? Do I have to return it? So the Rav said to him, according by the letter of the law, you're allowed to keep the money. The money is yours. Great. Guy goes home, $10,000. He couldn't fall asleep that night. He realized, look, I'm happy. I'm celebrating. I just made $10,000. But there is some Jew out there who lost $10,000. How could I enjoy it? How could I celebrate if there's a Jew who's lost $10,000? So he goes back to the hotel. He says, I want to see your register. And he checks the register for every guest that the hotel has had for the last week goes through the register, and he calls every single person. Did you lose something? No. Did you lose something? No. Did you lose something? No. Did you lose something? Yes. What did you lose? $10,000. I found your money. I'll be right over. Gets in his car. He drives over to the guy's house. He comes in. He says, listen, I found your $10,000. The guy says, how could I ever repay this? This is unbelievable. I can't believe you're giving me. He said, yes, I found your money. I even spoke to Allah authority. He said, I'm allowed to keep it, but I know that you'd be upset, and therefore, I'm giving it back to you. The guy says, one second. What did the Allah authority say? He said that really, technically, the money is mine. I could keep it, but I know, you know, we both know it's yours. He says, hold on a second, I don't go for technicalities. Say, the money is yours? Yes. I don't accept gifts. I want you to keep the money. I'm not taking the money back. He says, what's that? Gift schmift. We all know the money is yours. Like, I, technically, halachically, it's mine. He says, I don't want the money back. He says, well, I, you know, I'm not going to keep it because we all know it's yours. He says, do you have a son? He says, yeah. Where is he? He's in my car. How old is he? He's 23. Well, I have a daughter who's 20. The two of them met. They got engaged, they gave them the money, everybody lived happily ever after. They probably had a fight at the wedding over the money, but other than that, they all lived happily ever after. Stop and think, how does a person do that? Man found $10,000, somebody try me. $10,000, and the guy calls, and he goes to try to return it? You know where that comes from? That kind of loyalty, that kind of concern for another Jew, that comes from the Torah. A person who's involved in Torah study absorbs values, and is willing to go even beyond the letter of the law. Technically, maybe I could keep it. But is that what the Torah really wants from me? That's what the Greeks were bothered by. The entire effort to shut down the pursuit of Torah is the effort that anti-Semites throughout history have made against the Jewish people. Why are they picking on us constantly? Why are they so bothered by us? The answer is we, with our refinement, which only comes through Torah, through our refinement, we represent their conscience. And they can't bear the fact of watching one nation that rises to such a spiritual level, that achieves such a spiritual plateau, and they know that the power source for the Jewish people is simply the Torah, the Torah that we study, the Torah that we observe, absorb. That's what the Greeks are trying to, sh sh to shut down. I was once walking in my neighborhood. It was a boiling hot Friday afternoon. My wife asked me to take the garbage. I'm out. If you've been to Israel, they have these huge green garbage dumpsters by every corner. They even call them in Hebrew the Tzfardeim, which are frogs, because they look like big green frogs. And they got to the garbage dumpster. I noticed a neighbor of mine, a Haredi neighbor from across the street, and he was up and in reaching for something in the garbage pail, in the garbage dumpster. So as I got there, obviously I said to him, do, do you need help getting in? Uh, he didn't appreciate the wit. And I watched him, and he reached, and he pulled out a carton, an empty cardboard box. He took the box, he crushed it up, and he threw it back into the garbage bin. And then he jumped up again, and again, he reached for another cardboard box. He pulled it, crushed it up, and he threw it back in. Now, far be it for me to judge anybody's hobbies. I'd never seen this before. I never saw people fishing for 
empty cardboard box cartons. And at a certain point, I said to him, what are you doing? So he turned to me, and I'll never forget the look on his face. He said to me, well, maybe you haven't heard. On Motzei Shabbos, on Saturday night, there's going to be a municipal strike. I want to make sure when the municipal strike happens, they're not going to collect the garbage. I want to make sure there's going to be enough room in the, major, in the main dumpsters that none of the neighbors on the block should be inconvenienced when they want to throw out their garbage. That's what Torah does to a person. Torah turns a person into a different type of human being. And that's what was troubling the Greeks. That's what was bothering them. When Hanukkah comes around, one of the messages, lighting that flame, rekindling the flame, we all know that Torah is a fire. Torah is called the white flyer and black fire. We want to rekindle the flame of Torah devotion. There is an angel, a sar, a spiritual being, so to speak, the ministering angel. You've all heard of the angel Gabriel, the angel Michael, the angel Raphael. Each one has a realm. Raphael is in charge of curing, and Gabriel is in charge of certain, carrying out certain strict judgment. There's a sar of Torah, and that sar of Torah is called Yophiel, the beauty of God, Yophiel. The Greeks represent beauty and culture, but it's a beauty and a culture, it's the antithesis of a Torah life. Our beauty in our culture is the Torah. The Torah is Yophiel, the Sar of Torah, the ministering angel is the angel Yophiel. That's our goal on Hanukkah, to try to strengthen our commitment to Torah, whether it involves studying Torah, going to a shir, going to a class, learning with a chavrusa, learning with a study partner. That's our goal on Hanukkah. And finally, one of the things that people grapple with most on Hanukkah, how do you greet each other? We know that in Rosh Hashanah, we say, Shana Tova. And on Pesach, we say, Chag Kosher, Kosher V'Sameach, Yavsha Kosher Pesach. And Purim, we say, Afrelech Purim, you should have a happy Purim. What is the traditional greeting for the Jews on Hanukkah? People say, Afrelech Hanukkah. According to our tradition, it's really Afrelech goes with Purim. The traditional greeting for Jews on Hanukkah has always been, Alichtige Hanukkah. You should have a lit up, an enlightened Hanukkah that it should be lit up with Torah, lit up with commitment, lit up with devotion, the opposite of what the Greeks were trying to stamp out. Therefore, we wish everybody to have a Lichtige Hanukkah.